Great. Well, I think people are still uh, coming in. Um, but I think as it's gone 5.30, we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll start this. Um, my name is Christopher Martin. I'm on the executive committee of the Urban Design Group and the director of Urban Strategy at Urban Movement. Um, amongst other roles, I'm also trustee of Living Streets, the UK charity for everyday walking. And Living Streets and the Urban Design Group are working together to ensure we get the streets we need in the coming months with joint events joint events and publications to come. I'm just going to share a couple of images. I hope you can all see that. Um, so tonight we will be focusing on streets, transport and movement. Um, first up from our panel we'll have Councillor Anna Richardson, who is Councillor and City Convener, City Convener for Sustainability and Carbon Reduction at Glasgow City Council, to tell us about the inspiring work we're seeing north of the border. Then Chris Boardman, um, Greater Manchester Cycling and Walking Commissioner, will update us on his thoughts and work in Greater Manchester. Brian Deegan will be up next, um, Infrastructure Advisor to the Mayor of Manchester and also a colleague of my uh, movement, um, and he will be discussing what good infrastructure looks like. Um, and last on the panel is um, John Dales, Director of Movement, who, who will um, bring us all together and set us up for our discussion. Just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, it'd be great if you can keep your microphones muted at all times throughout the first hour and put any questions you might like in the chat. There's a series of people at the Urban Design Group who will be picking those questions up for us to discuss in the conversation. Um, there'll be a second hour for those who want to stay in a more informal setting and we can we can have a more informal, informal um, discussion then. Um, so thanks for tuning in. Um, as you probably know, this is part of a series that the Urban Design Group are undertaking all about how we design our towns and cities, both now um, but importantly in the future. And, um, and the focus for tonight, as I said, is streets and transport. Um, please do check out the events page you can see on the Urban Design website there for more information of the future events and how to get involved. Um, I've been, just to just sort of set the tone, I've been reflecting a lot recently, um, but never before has government, the press or the public been as interested in the design of our towns and cities as they are at the moment. We've heard so much over the last few weeks about what COVID-19 means for cities, the way we live, where we move, and the way we'll work. And this is likely because um, now more than ever, we're being made acutely aware of the negative effects that certain urban conditions can have on our lives, in particular, our health, happiness, and prosperity. The point we should be focusing on, and what I want to focus the conversation on tonight, is not what, what things will be like afterwards, but how do we get the future right? This topic is at the heart of a new proposition from the Urban Design Group. Um, that went live on the website today, highlighting how we can answer this question in London and setting out the process by which UK councils can achieve it under current policy and guidance. We, of course, need to act fast um, to protect our cities right now, but also be reactive and, and, and try and break bad habits to find gracious solutions to the challenges we face. The immediate, immediate solution to this crisis has got to be space. And we're going to hear more about the excellent work that cities across the UK are undertaking to respect to this later. Space is and will be the commodity that we consider more carefully following this crisis, I hope. Essentially, how do we use the space we have to tackle this and the future crises we'll face, as well as delivering the advantages of cities for people? Obviously, we need space for movement and we'll focus on this tonight. We need space for work, leisure and also play. And the Urban Design Group proposition I've mentioned highlights how we can better connect people to nature at the moment, but also in the future. We need more space for children and community, this crisis has brought communities together and made them stronger. To support, the, um, to, to support this, we need to keep residential streets as places where children can learn to ride a bike, play together, and community life can flourish. And this sort of sense of community that I've, I've experienced and we've, we've sort of collectively built and worked hard for over the last few weeks, how can we protect that? Um, and finally, just to say, we also sorely need space for business more than ever at the moment, because essentially the economic fallout of this crisis will be at, an economy close to being on its knees. So how do we use the space we have in a way that actually, not anecdotally, strengthens the economy for all and gives us vibrant, prosperous and fun spaces? One thing I know for certain, uh, we're all going to need the good laugh when this is over. So we need, to, we need to act now on our streets to make sure we keep businesses and social life alive. And the only conceivable way for pubs and restaurants, for example, to meet physical distancing rules going forward is if we can put some tables and chairs on the streets. Just to, to wrap up, to my mind, Despite what anyone might specialise in on this call or what you're mainly interested in, I think this is an economic recovery strategy at heart. We need to prioritise space for economic recovery, space for health, space for community and space for life. And when it comes to transport, we either have to deliver all these things with it or only allow the most space efficient transport possible to make space for recovery. 
So with that in mind, I'll hand over um, to our exciting panel for their thoughts. Um, and as I said, please put questions in the chat. And first we have Councillor Anna Richardson to talk about Glasgow. Thank you for that introduction and for uh, inviting me to speak a little bit tonight about Glasgow's work so far. I'm going to give a very brief background of what we're doing in Glasgow before I talk about where we think we're going. So for those who aren't familiar with Glasgow, we have in recent years, just like so many other cities, had a renewed focus on transport and the impact it has on tackling inequalities, climate change and improving people's health and quality of life. So, for example, uh, even before this, this crisis happened, we were hard at work on a variety of policies. We put in the first low emission zone in Scotland, that's already in place and into year two. And we have several major cycling infrastructure projects already under construction around the city. And with our city region deal, we've got 17 uh, streets throughout the city centre that will be redesigned uh, to enable more space for walking and cycling. We're also actually investigating workplace parking levy as a tool to help us accelerate these changes that we know that we need to see. And the strategy work that underpins all these projects is essential too. So we're currently developing a new transport strategy, a city centre plan, and our very first livable neighbourhood strategy. We intend to have all these strategies in place for next year to set that framework. But of course, while all this work was going on, the world changed immeasurably, and we find ourselves now trying to look ahead whilst we also react to the pandemic that we're right in the middle of. And what this crisis has shown us is that we're certainly going in the right direction and all the strategies we have in place already and are developing are going in the right direction. But we need to talk about these changes now in terms of weeks rather than years. And I think that is a huge shift for anybody involved in transport. And so much of what we know already and we talk about in these forums about how people use streets when traffic is reduced is now being played out in real time during the lockdown. And that's really, really exciting. I don't need to describe the residential streets that have seen streams of families walking and cycling about communities coming together, as, as Christopher said, and using the road as well as the pavement when there wasn't enough room. All of us have seen that in our own communities. So now when we speak with residents about how we could transform neighbourhoods, we can begin to tap into that collective memory and tell stories about what lockdown looked like and how that can actually, in many ways, be a positive future. And that could be a really powerful tool, enable far more meaningful consultations than perhaps we've been able to do before. And perhaps too, it'll be an opportunity for us to break down some of that silo uh, talk that we have. We mentioned cyclists, pedestrians, motorists, as if they're not just people who are making rational transport choices for themselves and their families that work in the environments that we have built around them. And I think there's something very exciting about all the people that all of us will have met and spoken to recently who have dragged a bike out of the shed or, or bought one for the first time uh, and are moving around the city in a way that they never imagined they would. And who maybe from in the future will have much stronger opinions about the consultations we have and about the projects we bring forward for the city. And I think that will be a real step change in terms of how we, we talk about who these projects are for. So what are we actually doing right now here in Glasgow? Well, the first step was to get something on the ground. I felt it was really important that we show that we're taking this public health crisis seriously and that we understand that the way our streets are configured has a direct impact on the safety of people while this virus is around us. So we identified two streets that have seen a huge leap in walking and cycling and are very overcrowded compared to how they were before the lockdown. The first is a very simple road closure alongside a busy West End Park called Kelvin Grove. It's in a high density uh, area uh, and all of our green spaces in Glasgow are taking a lot of pressure uh, in terms of the number of people who are wanting to move around and exercise uh, and especially in parts uh, such as the West End of the city. So it's essential that we ease those bottlenecks where we can. And secondly, uh, just a few days ago, we put in a temporary cycle lane along the River Clyde. This is one of our most used cycle routes, even under normal circumstances. And the shared space that we've used up till now just wasn't cutting it anymore. So we freed up more space for walking and jogging along the river, as well as giving cyclists a straighter, more direct route uh, on this reclaimed part of carriageway. So we've used these two installations to prove the concept, to prove the concept to ourselves that we can implement change within days, that it can be done cheaply and be effective, that we can bring together the team of staff that you need to make this type of thing happen at high speeds, uh, that everybody can work together, even when we're uh, all working from home uh, in challenging circumstances, that we can go within a local authority from site selection to fully installed and on the ground within a couple of weeks. And I think that's testament to the absolute commitment of every single member of the team who's been dedicated to making this happen in very, very strange circumstances. 
And hopefully that's given us all some confidence uh, to build on that learning as we move forward. But we needed to prove the concept to the wider city too. We need to show that we are serious about keep, keeping people safe, not just from COVID, but also from traffic. So we're now taking a few more days to work up a wider plan and basing that around three main themes that echo the transport strategy work we already have as a base. So first of all, making plenty of space for people in the city centre when they start to come back. We know this must be prioritised if we're to see economic activity picking up, as Chris said in his introductory comments. Secondly, we're going to select our T-roll routes that require cycle lanes so we can move as many people as possible once the more normal routines of life kick back in. We already have the knowledge of where our key network needs to be, and this is simply a matter now of identifying which parts of that network we can put in using temporary measures. And finally, we need a neighbourhood level response. So much of the discussion around lockdown has been on that community level, and we need to do that in terms of our transport response too. So we'll include more space on local high streets for those businesses that desperately need to address the pinch points that are being created by queuing. But we also need to accelerate our school streets programme. Currently, we have it operating at six primary schools in Glasgow, but a rapid expansion of that will be crucial when we get back to any kind of education within our schools. And we cannot allow a potential increase in traffic to cause rat runs and unsafe neighbourhoods once again. So filter permeability will need to feature in the medium term. And I'm actually most excited about this final strand of work and the potential that it holds. I've always been focused on the need to make changes within local communities. This is where we will have the most impact on the many segments of our population that are not always as catered uh, well for in transport planning. It's about the journeys that make up our children's routines, the local trips that feature heavily in the lives of older people. And indeed, we have a number of communities in Glasgow who feel no real connection to the city centre and rarely make use of it. So we can't address the inequalities of our city without taking these improvements directly to the people within their own communities. And during lockdown, so many of us have adapted to new local ways of living. So recreation now means our local park, shopping means the local shops, and we have new work patterns, although they have a varying degrees of success. And I say that with three kids currently locked out of my kitchen. So we can lock in some of the reduced travel demand that's happening, as well as the current changes that we're seeing to how people move. If we take bold and decisive action now. And I think we can use the temporary nature of a lot of these measures as a strength, because we can continue to react and shape to the changing circumstances that we have at the moment. We can take guesses about what six months time will look like or a year, but we have to accept that there will be change that right now we probably can't yet imagine. And so we need to keep an element of flexibility within the work that we do. And as I say, I think the, the temporary infrastructure has a strength there because it can adapt and it can change and we can make it bigger or we can move it if we need to. And that's really going to be important as we move on. And throughout this emergency, I think transport has shone in the public eye like never before. As a sector, it can really change people's lives, and indeed it can protect lives if we do it right. Those of us who are immersed in this work have always known that, and now we have a chance to show everybody else as well. And we have a responsibility to live up to that, to stop talking about the benefits that we could bring to society, and to start building them right outside everybody's home, school and workplace. I'll leave my comments there. Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much, Anna. That's great. Definitely um, plenty of comments coming through in the chat and lots of questions. So I think maybe we'll, um, we'll, we'll start the conversation after, after the presentations to make it to, to maximise that time. So I'd now like to invite um, Chris Boardman, um, Greater Manchester's Cycling and Walking Commissioner, um, to update us on, on his and their work in Greater Manchester, as, long as, well, um, as, as well as any thoughts he might have on these issues. Well, it's really hard to know where to start with this one. Um, and thank you for that, Anna. Uh, you don't realise the impact that you're actually having elsewhere, but I'll um, I'll get to that in a moment. This has been fascinating experience, uh, absolutely fascinating, I'm sure for everybody. And I didn't realise it was going to be harder working from home than I've ever worked in my life. And I think it's because we've realised that the and I'm really being careful not to use the word opportunity where there's tens of thousands of people dying, but the situation that we found ourselves in presents itself with an opportunity uh, to change. Um, and we've got days and weeks to make it work. So I'm coming at this more from a nitty gritty point of view, a, a real pragmatist. We all know what we want to achieve. So when this started off, we realised very quickly that the, uh, about 45% of the population of Greater Manchester was actually classed as key workers. Um, and then we all realised really quickly, you know what, they're carers and, and they're, 
they're low paid people, they're hospital cleaners, and they need to get to work. Now, a third of all households in Greater Manchester don't have access to a car, and those people normally rely on public transport. And not only that, we know that their average commute is three miles. You know, so it, it, we, it all comes together, and it shouldn't surprise us that we've seen a lot of people riding bikes. Absolutely, it's been sunny. I mean, you couldn't have brought the circumstances together, really, that would create this environment. We turn off traffic, we turn on the weather, we don't give people another way of getting around, and we've, we've almost, not forced, but we've given them the opportunity to travel differently, and they are. So we, we saw two weeks ago we had a 22% rise uh, in, in bike use, both for leisure, for, for getting exercise, because boredom is a real thing. Psychology is everything at the moment. And people are bored and people have got kids. Um, and the kids, I can't let them play with their mates. They can't go to the park. They never like going for a walk. What am I going to do with them? All right, go out in the street. All right, I'll go out with you. Yeah, that was quite nice. Should we go a bit further? Actually, this is really good. And this has been happening for a period of time long enough to start to embed behaviour change. So we've seen that. It was up uh, by 22% on pre-COVID levels uh, about two weeks ago. Um, and bear in mind that every other mode of transport we all know has gone down. Car use gone down over 60%. Public transport over 90%. Bike use up 22% despite having nowhere to go. That's risen again to an average uh, of about over 40% increase now. And we saw a peak last week of a 74% increase in bike use. Uh, and to give you a, a bit of context for that, this is a bit of a little bit more sophisticated than back of a fag packet, but that's 179,000 journeys or trips in a single day. Now, if you put all those people on trains uh, that are on, a, let's say, start with a tram, that's 844 full tram carriages. We can't do that. Uh, it's 120,000 uh, uh, car trips. Uh, to give you a context, that's, um, that's the M60 ring road for Manchester. All the lanes in both directions completely full. So I suppose what I'm coming around to is this isn't about a better future. All the arguments that we've made for decades about health and it's a nicer place to live and lowers pollution, and they're just not landing. This is about practical right now. And I think it's really important that we separate the two things. There is uh, dealing with the virus and changing the way we travel. And the two go together because what you need to keep people apart right now is a, the, the biggest consultation you could ever have um, almost globally. So all the messaging right now that we've been doing is we've got to make this about the virus because the person on the street who normally hates those people in Lycra and doesn't like cyclists and anybody who rides a bike, they're, they're in that class. Um, now they've chosen to use a bike to get around a little bit and it's something that they can do. So we've got to keep two metres apart. So instead of saying we're going to ban pavement parking and the politicians get voted out, we can now start to say we need to keep people two metres apart we need the space for people move the cars off and the signage said safe streets, save lives. So we're addressing that need and it's also addressing the long-term behaviour change. Um, I think it's also an opportunity and we need to handle this one really carefully that everybody who's choosing to make those short journeys on a bike now is saving space on public transport for people who have to do it. And there's 120,000 car journeys, that is, I think it's a, about 270-mile queue of traffic, that would be, uh, if they all got in a car. And that's 1.5 occupancy as well. You know, we've done some geeky stuff. Uh, no space between the cars, three-metre length car, still 267 miles long. People who are choosing to get on a bike are stopping that happening. So we need to frame it that anybody, and we even don't use the word cycling, who chooses to travel by bike is helping all of us. And so we become part of the we become part of the solution, and we stop being the enemy, and we stop the tribalisation. In fact, it's the people who are speeding uh, and putting other people. We need to put the focus over there that they are our collective enemy. So there's a chance to change all of that, and it's it's so so important. The government's announcement, of course, crystallised everything. That really brought or galvanised it. It brought it all together, and it's a stronger language than we've ever heard. 
probably the people in this in this uh, webinar now are the ones that will have heard and realised that it isn't two billion pounds. It's guidance that says you must do this, and um, we've never had that from a government before. And that's that's proper culture changing stuff. To have to just sit and watch television and listen to the transport secretary saying, "Got to ride a bike, got to ride a bike, got to walk." You know, you're helping your country if you do these things. It's just amazing, and it's put massive pressure on the people who really don't want to do it but i'm not going to say it out loud and we talk about capacity because we don't want to say the word cars um, and and the pressure is on them because they've been told you have to make space for cycling and walking and the only place that's coming from is the road uh, and I, so now i'm sensing the real pressure and also a lot of excitement we've got politicians who want to do this um, and it does tend to be the poor officers who've, who've been given the job of doing it so in Greater Manchester right now, um, we've announced a fund of £5 million. Um, we've got a, a rough list of what's happening in each of the 10 boroughs. And now they're just on the ground trying to work out how to make this thing happen. And it's gritty and it's make it up as we go along, but they're actually doing it. Um, we're going to try and pull that together next week into a cohesive package. Uh, and it's exciting times. I think the bit that's really helped me is... is when the mayor has now said, right, I'm going to help you drive this through. So rather than him working through me, I'm now starting to work through him because this is the political problem and this is an answer to the pandemic. This is not cycling. This is actually this problem I need to solve. Um, and that's the way that, that we're coming at it. I don't want to go on too much longer because I'd rather actually answer questions uh, if anybody's got any for me. But the psychology point I mentioned earlier is everything right now. Uh, and that's why the messaging is so important that we make it about tackling the virus and use temporary measures. Don't even worry, people, that there's an instant cry for, let's make it permanent. Don't worry about that. Let people have the confidence and give them the, the courage to try it by saying, it's okay, just do it with cones. And, and if you don't like it, when this is all over, we'll just take it out because it gives them the chance to go further. And when they've gone further, we'll have that reverse consultation and say, did you like it? Do you want to keep it? So people don't have to guess about what happens when we close the street and what's it going to do to my business. They're going to have had an experience and base their opinion on that. And I believe in this product. And I believe if we can just get people to try it, they'll want to keep it. Uh, and therein lies, I think, I can't avoid the word, the opportunity for to address the virus and for our future. And one last word, really, about things that are happening around the country that has had the biggest impact in our area because it's really uncomfortable for people's pride, their, their civic pride, when they see Liverpool announce 100 kilometres of pop-up bike lanes. And Manchester's going, we haven't got our act together and we're telling people how we're leading the way. And that's the best kind of positive peer pressure that you could ever have. Uh, what's happening in Glasgow, but all of these things, they all add up and it, and it gathers momentum with each other. Um, I mean, Simon O'Brien, the uh, commissioner for uh, the Liverpool City region, shared with me uh, how he actually got contact with the mayor and said, listen, I'm going to put out a press statement uh, about how it is because I've got to be authentic. And we need, if we're not doing what Manchester's doing, then we're going to get left behind. And so we're all putting pressure on each other. And that's a fantastic thing. So what's happening in Glasgow, what's happening in Liverpool, you're not just affecting you, you're actually affecting the whole country. And we've got weeks to get this right. So I don't know about anybody else. I'm having sleepless nights. And I don't know about a beer when this is all over, but I've been having quite a lot of beer, actually, um, over the past few weeks. But that's also because I've got five of my six kids here and grandkids for the duration. So uh, I'm not sure my health's doing too well out of this whole thing. But I'll leave it there. Uh, so thanks. That's brilliant. Thanks so much, Chris. That's, um Lots to think about and lots to talk about. I know the chat's been going a bit crazy. Um, the the intercity competition that you, you've talked about is fantastic and it's a, a really nice way to, um, to sort of see the future and wrapping. And I think, I think so to just to sort of build on that, it'd be nice to get Brian's thoughts and that before we have our sort of more, more of a conversation about um, we know what we need to do and, and this sort of, and how, how do we sort of, how do this, what does this infrastructure look like, I suppose, is what we're trying to say. And, um, and how, um, how do we make other cities jealous? Brian. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> Thanks for letting me speak. Uh, yeah, I'm going to get straight down the brass tacks with uh, 
just a list of things that we can do really and how we can do them the the first i would suggest is some kind of physical distance strip and uh there's nothing stopping anybody going out right now if you're a local authority <laughs> not if you've got your own stencils um but if you go out right now and mark out a mandatory cycle lane it's the same marking as a bus lane once that marking's in there the line itself becomes the traffic order so you're legally good to go even if there's parking inside it or there's local access you've got something some space that's cordoned off for other modes in there particularly walking and cycling in there once that line's in there you can then start p- placing objects of it perhaps flexible posts perhaps planters if you want to make it more aesthetic or perhaps whatever cones you've got lying around the uh, department like uh, Anna was talking about. Get something on it. It deters cars from dipping into that space. And pedestrians can walk out into it. Cyclists can ride into it. And we start reallocating road space in the way that perhaps we should have been doing all these years. So that's number one. And it's just crack on with it. It's the biggest impact and perhaps the easiest thing to do. Um, I'll go into number two, and that's footway parking. It's definitely an issue outside of London. It's still an issue in certain parts of London as well. Uh, there was a scheme in um, Levenjoon where they put in some bollards just to stop the cars parking on the footway. Uh, people have been going on about this, particularly living streets and, uh, and pedestrian campaigners for years. The crisis has brought on the need to actually put some bollards in and stop the cars actually using up all the footway space because there's no point in having an emergency where you need to physically distance if you have no space to even walk on your footway. And particularly as the cars come back, it's going to be even more prevalent that we can use the footway in its entirety um, or perhaps extend it in there. Uh, Another one that people are doing is suspending parking bays outside shops and pharmacies so people can have extra space for queue for queuing there's been a few good ones i think healing were one of the first ones on the map to do that so again local authorities know how to do the orders it's quite simple stuff in there just get it suspended get that space tied over and at least people can distance while they're queuing um moving on the kind of low traffic neighborhood approach that we've been talking about for several years um really now it couldn't be more useful really particularly as cars start to come back if those rat runs are still there particularly when there's kids off school and they're walking in the middle of the road there because they have to physically distance if we've got speeding cars moving through our residential areas that's a problem so we can think about putting some filters in and again brighton madeira drive was one of the first examples of that one great get some planter boxes in there put in whatever you've got again, block that road so at least cyclists can go through it and pedestrians are going and the kids can be a little bit safer when they're playing out there. Um, then, then there's a whole raft of just like a really, really easy things we could do, like a decluttering. Now's the time to to take, get rid of those A-boards that we've been whinging about for years, particularly like people who are in wheelchairs. Now's the time to get rid of them. Do we really need 15 signs all the way along one little short stretch of highway telling you all the different parking regulations. Can some of them go? Can bins be re- relocated? And we finally get rid of some of these defunct phone boxes. Dead straightforward stuff that your maintenance teams can crack on with. I said in there. Um, another one, guardrail removal. It, it kind of stunned me. I've been working in London for like uh, 20 years and then they moved out around the rest of the country and uh, so that everybody was still using and putting in brand new guardrail now's the time when it's a real problem, particularly around signal control junctions. If people are sheep penned in, and we do call them sheep pens in engineering, then everybody's close, so they can't distance, they can't step into the road, they can't spread out there. If you're walking along the street and you need to pass into the road, get past someone, the guardrail's there, you've got a problem. Let's start taking it out and making the case for that. Lots of the uh, evidence have done, the TFL did some research that showed a uh, and over 50% drop in collisions when guardrail was removed. So the case for it being a safety intervention is long since gone. Um, one of the things I like that they're doing in Paris, in fact, they're doing so many good things in Paris, and definitely uh, that's another city that we should perhaps be competitive with. Uh, but pedestrian priority streets, some kind of marking that would legitimise walking in the middle of the carriageway so cars don't feel it's their God-given right to take up the entire space, particularly, and I'll say it again, as they start to come back, which they are doing in increasing numbers, we need something, maybe it's a planter, maybe it's a bench, maybe it's a cafe stall, something to like say to, to drivers, hey, watch out for people. There was a famous one in Hackney and Narrow Way where they put different coloured painting markings and stuff, all cheap, just let drivers know something else is going on here. So again, we can do that. No orders required, just a bit of creativity. And there's a lot of people on this uh, on this webinar that I think would understand that. 
Um, another thing, temporary signal crossings of our busy roads. If people having to walk 400 metres to get to a signal crossing of a main road in there, and that's the only place they feel safe, and everybody's congregating on, on the one point, waiting for the time to cross there, which could be two minutes in some cases. If we can put temporary signal crossings in there every 100, 150 metres along some of our major roads, then we disperse the effect and we don't get people gathering. And again, all that equipment's there and ready to roll in there. More, I'm, I'm going to keep going. Uh, speed reduction, interesting one. You can look at uh, uh, speed limits, for example, but I would say that the signs work. People have done some really great kind of rainbow signs, slow down, save lives. There's a whole sorts of stuff you can put out there. They're just information signs, but you get that message over to drivers that maybe you should start thinking about other people and the way you're actually behaving in this area. So there's lots of stuff we can do with hearts and minds on, on speed reduction. And, and it definitely was one of the things that got like a mayor's to take uh, the situation seriously when speed started uh, skyrocketing. Um, there's thousands of kilometers of mandatory cycle lane out there in the UK. It's just most of it's got cars parked in it or people don't like to use it because cars are encroaching into it. Like I said, with the uh, physical distance strip, these can be upgraded. Cones can be put on them, flexible posts, something to make them usable for pedestrians stepping out and for cyclists going along as well. So there's a huge amount of upgrading we can do. Uh, going, um, yeah, signs. Um, like uh, there was like temporary traffic signs that we put up in London. Narrow lanes don't overtake cyclists in there. Went down really well. And when we are doing physical distance trips, perhaps we're like uh, going out into the carriageway, but we still want cyclists to be in that area. It's time to warn the drivers to expect cyclists to be in that space because we needed extra footway for the people queuing. So if you're doing one thing, think about the impact on another, on a, of another. And all these are standard signs that are available in there. Um, another one. Really, we want people to start cycling to work, don't we? I'm sure we all do. Well, they need somewhere to park the bike. So now's the time to really take cycle parking seriously. It's very difficult in a lot of cities to find anywhere to securely park your bike. There might be some Sheffield stands stuck around the back near the bins, but really we need them front and centre now. And the best place to put cycle parking is in the carriageway. Take a car parking space, you can get like a eight to 12 bikes in that kind of area. And that's what employers need. And really, we want to encourage employers to send people who can ride and can walk into work first. So for me, cycle parking is absolutely crucial. And the last one I'll talk about, and I'm hoping there's going to be some action on this, is the side road zebras. Now that people are walking and feeling freer to walk in the carriageway space and feeling more confident going out with the kids, we need to maintain that. And as the cars come back, if they start grabbing that land and space and time and the behaviour starts getting worse, then it'll be a real problem. A simple marking like a side road zebra, just a zebra marking across side roads to give pedestrians confidence, to also let drivers know that they should be yielding to pedestrians walking across there. We've shown um, from the research we did with the Transport Research Laboratory, that 82% of drivers give way when they see that marking compared to a baseline with no marking of 26%. So that's uh, something to think about as well. I'm hoping the government uh, meets us halfway on this one. That's kind of the end of my list of what to do. There are other things, but there are lots of stuff that you can crack on with. They're not difficult. These are all easy engineering solutions and uh, everybody at local authorities know how to do the orders. So get creative and start doing stuff. We can't do enough, but we can definitely do too little quote of the WHO there. I'll finish on that. Very nice, Brian. Thank you very much. I think, I think we can just finish there and go home. It's, uh, it's all settled then. Um, um. <laughs> I think, well, yeah, I mean, the uh, the comment, again, is adding to, so we're going to have a very lively discussion. Um, but before that, um, I'd like to introduce and uh, pass the mic over to John Dales, um, Director of Urban Movement, for um, sort of his thoughts on the on these issues and, um, and sort of to get us in the discussion mood. John. I'm just trying to work out whether I have to uh, unmute myself, and I do, apparently. <laughs> Good evening. Um, yeah, where do, where do we go with all that? And I'm trying to sort of start from the point of view of, of looking at a number of the questions that are on the, the chat on the side. And I suppose there are two broad um, issues that are out there, which is the need for speed and what we do when we do move. And I think possibly the best way for me to start is just to almost have a tale of one city or is it in terms it's a London borough and indeed one road. And just some work I've been doing the last couple of days, reflecting on a number of the real challenges we have here. Firstly, with the best rule in the world, it's a huge task to completely review a large part of your network 
and just and then do something about it in a, in a few weeks. We have to just understand that that is an issue. Each of us will know here, there, 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 and there. We should do something. I know that, but we should do something there. As I think what Brian has just spoken about, a lot of different measures that we can deploy, and they can be done. So I've just been looking at a, 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 a six and a half meter long corridor and thinking, let's just go all the way along it. What is it that we will do? And for the for the, to to grab space quickly, it's very much along the lines of what Brian was talking about. We've got bus lanes. Let's make them seven to seven or twenty four seven. Let's widen them if we can. Let's extend them to stop lines if we can. Although then you have issues potentially with safety of left turners and stuff like that. Where we've got advisory lanes, why can't we make them mandatory lanes if we can mandate them, make them mandatory cycle lanes? Um, uh, can they be 24-7? In other words, do we, do people need access to the curbside through that? If not, then we can protect them and we'll protect that very simply and cheaply using um, wands or wand orcas or things like that. Um, what else have we got? We've got parking uh, and loading bays at curbside. Well, we can clear those out for the moment. Nearly, I think the, 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 that that's relatively easy to do simply to, to close them off. We probably need to think about maintaining access to deliveries, but that can be constrained to different times of day. Um, and then the other issue is the, where are our specific pinch points in the town centres? And are they specific? Are they um, through a whole high street, for example? And how do we just grab the space from the carriageway for that? All of these things are relatively simple to do, and there's a ton to do. And I think I come back to really something that Chris said right at the outset, which is, it, in a sense, space is the, the final frontier. We are battling for space, and we need to reallocate that space as quickly as possible. I wish it were really simple. Um, and I suppose just, I don't have, I wish I had, Chris probably does, the Chris Borden's the kind of person who will have these numbers at hand because you thought about it. The length of roads that any borough or highway authority might be responsible for. They're huge numbers. And I think, so where do you start? And each of us could have a particular thought about this is the most important because that might be our high street. Or if we're thinking about filtering a neighbourhood, well, mine's an important one. And I think there are some huge challenges here. And I suppose the best thing I can say is what, the, what any authority needs is to start developing a plan and start doing the first bits of that plan now. Um, and, and do it as cheaply and, 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 and as, as possible. Um, uh, so, for example, some of the examples, one of the schemes that Anne has been responsible for up in Glasgow, the space has been grabbed with some traffic cones for the moment because that's what they had right there and then to do it now. You could then grab that with something that's a little bit more robust, like water-filled barriers, and then you could possibly come along in another few weeks or a couple of months' time with something more robust or and or perhaps more beautiful. And I've noticed some of the comments about this, oh, no, we're not more bollards. You kind of think, we've got to get the space. And if we, we need to act quickly to get the space, and then once we've got it, we can do something more refined or sophisticated with it. But the scale of the challenge is huge. As I say, just a sheer um, kilometrage of roads that we are talking about. Um, and the purely practical issues related to doing something different over such an area, especially that when it means the deployment of kit. I've literally no idea how many water filled barriers there are in Britain. Then you think about the procurement processes the local authorities much, must go through. Quite often that is through their contractors, and their contractors have what they have. In the, in the shed, so to speak, and if the contractors don't have it in the shed, they're going to need to know that the thing that they're going to have to buy specifically for this is going to be able to be reused again and then again. And actually, there's a real challenge there, which is there's a huge amount of temporary stuff we're going to need on a scale that we've never needed before. And then in due course, we probably will never need that many bollards or water-filled barriers again because we'll gradually we'll take them away hopefully replace them with something will hold the space more permanently and that might be a more um, a better bollard so to speak or it might be um, granite and concrete so there are some real challenges here and i suppose the, the focus for me therefore is that local authorities need to develop a plan and start doing the first things of those as soon as they possibly can um, there's been quite a lot of chat um, uh, in this sphere recently about can we do this, can we do that, what are the orders, what do we need? Um, I, I am personally, although I am not a, uh, a highway chief highway officer, um, I'm personally of the view that you, 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 you um, ask uh, for forgiveness, so to speak, rather than for permission when things are important. And my 
take on this it's a public health emergency and people are saying well what do we do with this and, and to be honest the orders are there and there's the, the time it will take to actually secure and procure kit and put it out will mean that we have time to do experimental or temporary orders um uh, whatever they are but actually my, my take on this is what do you do if, what would you do if there was a gas leak yeah we'll do that you know that's a good enough reason in a lot of these places especially where you've got your pinch point grounding and high streets i don't need to ask i'm the highway authority highways act um road traffic act we can do this it's our highway authority and we have the powers to do this we are rightly required if we're a highway authority to ask certain permissions or to do it right but actually our, there are roads and actually if we say that the need is urgent we can just do that and then backfill the paperwork later i'm a little bit perhaps or on the sort of um uh i tend towards the cavalier side that myself but it's not cavalier because this is urgent and so I'm really trying to summarize all of that, but I think we'll take more of it in the questions is it's a huge task, a huge task. And I'm just going to use, Chris didn't want to use a word. Um, I don't want to use a word either because it's always been used, but it is literally unprecedented. It is what we have at the moment, the size of this task. Then you magnify that by the speed with which we must move. And this is putting local authorities, which are under huge stress in any case, in all sorts of other ways related to this crisis, and for the last decade have been in any case, in terms of funding and the number of resources they have. That's just the number of people to do stuff. Then there's the question about where's the money coming from, and there's promises of money, and that, like I've just said, it takes time. There's 250 million. I think that was more or less plucked out of the sky by Grand Chaps the other night. Okay, so the, he's got to, you know, work out with the Treasury and how do we bid for that? I was pleased to say that actually speaking in uh, Scotland the other day, obviously there's this 10 million from uh, the Scottish government for this sort of stuff. I understand that that could easily be increased and that although it's a bidding process, it's just almost like a check. Um, and therefore, local authorities have got some stuff that will come up good. Their money will be del will delivered pretty quickly. I'd like to think, I hope the guidance is about to come out. It was hopefully coming out this week in London with a similar thing for the £45 million uh, that, 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 that the government has got, that the, the, the TFL has got. Again, this idea is you bid. If this looks halfway good, you're going to do it. You're going to get the money. Because I think there is an extent to which, coming back, and I'll, I'll finish now, the pra sheer practical issues related to this are such that, that actually it's, it's hard to spend the money, which is a real shame, as quickly as you might in any case. And therefore, probably the, the release of money, so long as the promise of it coming there, but the release of the cash coming through um, isn't the biggest concern. Um, the, the biggest concern I have is that we get on the front foot and start deploying stuff as soon as we can, because as numbers of people said in the comments, and as we all know, the t time is of the essence. We don't really probably have more than a handful of weeks to start really grabbing and changing things. And that affects also how it will appear public, publicly as well. There are loads of people who aren't remotely engaged with this topic who just think I need to do the thing I need to do. The obvious thing for me to do is to do it this way. And that might be jumping in a car because I'm scared of getting on the bus. I never liked the bus anyway, actually. And I had to get it against my better or the tube or whatever it might be. So speed, the scale of the problem and the speed is key. And therefore clarity of thinking of doing things really, really quickly and cheaply. Now we can always make it better in due course are key. Thanks, John. That's excellent. Um, definitely want to start picking some of these things up in the uh, conversation now. And I'd invite sort of, we're still getting the questions in the chat. And um, if you keep those coming, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of feed them through to the panel now. Um, 